What up mi gente, TR here. Today's episode of Real Surf Stories. On today's episode, we sit down with Marco Pacheco. What up mi gente, here with Marco Pacheco, a little surf cast action. What's up, brother? Oh, first time for me, thank you for having me. Marco is a early Costa Rica visionary from the golden era of Tico surfing, and is an amazing craftsman, surfboard builder, and has really wandered through so many aspects of surf culture and life that it's super inspiring and I'm psyched to be able to get in this conversation here. So I want to go all the way back. You welcomed me to your country 30 years ago. I've enjoyed surfing with you so much all these years and you inspire me a lot. And one thing I don't actually know is I know that you've been here in Guanacaste a lot of years. Where are you actually from? I was born in San Jose, in Hospital San Juan de Dios, and um, my dad was an agriculture engineer, but he also had a military background. Uh, so that means my earliest memories, Tony, uh, is like me, three years old, driving down what is called El Cañón del Tigre towards Witches Rock before it was a national park. It was called Hacienda Santa Rosa. My dad's uh, friend, they had shared some military background, but they were now in Costa Rica. Post any ma military uh, operation in the past, but now we're drinking buddies. I remember having uh, Gallo Pinto with Los Peones de la Casona when it was a farm, and, and we would drive down to the north end of which is Rock, uh, Playa Naranjo, and my dad would blow dynamite underwater and get sacks of fish. I remember Pargos really well the color. Something that my earliest memories of are of me at three years old or under or a little bit, uh, running towards the rock to avoid the blast. And I say that emotionally because it is truly my, before that I don't remember uh, being a child other than holding on to my dad's uh, Land Cruiser who had three shear, reverse, first, second and third. And then I'm the passenger, and I'm looking down and saying to my dad, are we going to drive down there? Because there was, it was just like, go broken rock. And these guys just love that sort of lifestyle. So that must have been quite a mission back in the day to Witch's Rock. From Liberia, it was probably oh, four it was or five dust, hours. Oh, it was dusty, huh? dusty. But, you know, time was different. Time were more elastic. You didn't have so, uh, such a quick response to it. We, we uh, have cell phones now, and, and we get where if somebody doesn't answer in five seconds. Back then, it's more like day to day, we're gonna sleep on the floor and, 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 and mats, rubber mats or whatever, and, and, and there's no air conditioning. In the cars, it's gonna be sunny. <laughs> and and, and it was, my dad was all about growing, um, uh, you know, he was an agriculture engineer, so he basically was developing. And in the meantime, he had a lifestyle that revolved around the ocean and hunting and fishing. Imagine me and I, if somebody detonate um, uh, TNT to get fish in a national park these days, that wasn't heard of. But that yeah. to me was For normal. our listeners, Minai is like the park ranger uh, system here in Costa Rica. Yeah, they wouldn't stand for that. Tell me this, when you first started surfing, going on your own surf trips with right. your buddies, how old were you? I was 18. 18 uh, years old. That was old. the year he had passed away. He oh. passed away in March. 15 and then uh, around August my friends I was living at the city I was disconnected going through high school it was a little tough because of his condition uh, but um, somehow he had prepared me for this lifestyle so your first trips to the surf where were you going Baca Barranca you know and I didn't make it my first board cost me 800 colones I don't, maybe it's like a $30 board these days. So what year are we talking about? 78. So what was the plan ship like? What, what my kind of guy, board my, my neighborhood guys, who uh, some of them uh, and I were going to uh, martial arts, taekwondo. I was already a red belt and I was following them. They got into taekwondo, I got into taekwondo. We play basketball together. We come here for like Guanacaste for New Year's. But we did it like, like after having lunch for Christmas with the family on the 25th, we pack and, and, and camped here in Langosta, for example. I was the only one surfing, but then 
uh, just not to get all scrambled up. It was them. I mean, it was me following them. And my my neighborhood was called San Pedro Barrio La Granja, which equates to like sort of like uh, Costa Rica's dog town because there was a lot of skateboarding where East and now it's in San Pedro. Uh, they were all like uh, coffee fields, and it was okay to go ride your bikes in mud. And there were no mountain bikes there. We just like we turned them into mountain bikes. Just and there were street bikes made in England with the traditional rally sort of type of um, yeah. And then one thing led to another. I was a PE teacher at the time. I was coming from that martial art background. And then uh, I'd say I was very making little money, but if I missed a, a weekend, it, it was a lot for me. I mean, I always found a way to go to the beach. It was like jump on the bus and then get off at Robley and walk towards Boca Barranca and there would be places for us to stay. And, and if you took Three dollars was enough to spend a weekend. It, that is, if you weren't getting a ride. Somebody, I didn't have a car until later on in my life, but I'll, that would never stop me. You know, uh, bus it, throw it on the on the underneath. Going to Limon, for example, like sometimes I get on the bus to Limon uh, for five hours. Sometimes standing up, I sleep in the park or Portete. Sometimes. I spent less time in the water because a wave came and broke your board and then you'd be back in another five hours on the bus. It was, but it was such a Shaolin kind of waiting outside the temple, just getting like, God, God, punished. And then, but you know, now that I look back, it, it's, it's all like a preparation to enjoy later, you know? Um, so like today, nine, uh, 2019, I'm still looking at the beauty. I don't see development as a as a something bad. No, it's it's all good. My daughter is going to school. She went. Um, she goes to good schools, which enables me to live here. You know, if we didn't have the schools that we have now, I have to go somewhere else to, so she gets a good education. Those days, we're looking at like early '70s, Costa Rica. The surfing was pretty much concentrated in the Boca Barranca area and in Limon, right? So yeah. how many surfers would you say roughly there were in the entire 50. country? 50. And you knew the them all country. by name. Wow. So and how many from San Jose, how many from the Caribe, and how many from the Pacific? I would say that San, that San Jose uh, population of surfers was 90%. Wow. And I didn't know many of the guys living in, in the Caribbean that surf because I only came after a few years, but still like early 80s, some of our guys from, from our district, from our neighborhood, would start dropping the name Limon. And that was a scary place. There was a story of my uh, uh, a pilot friend of mine, Carlos Montedioca, who broke a board and then the, half the board got stuck in the reef in Playa Bonita. And the story was like he, until another bigger wave came and, and, and uh, detached him from. So that was kind of like lingering, God, uh, please not go there. But eventually we went and, and, and then there was fear. And now it's nostalgia because my body is not up the par. I mean, I, I go on and watch. But I, see, I now enjoy everything but the wave. I enjoy the people, I enjoy watching other people surf, and I'm a surfboard designer, so my mind is always, it has an age, it's just my body. Yeah. So uh, if I can contribute to a, a, a movement of, of surfers that are helping young kids, because I was, somebody handed me boards when I was young, they saw something in me, and they trusted, and then this is my way to say thank you and pay back. Uh, yeah. Amazing. So. Who were the first surfers that were actually getting barreled, coming out, doing good turns, the first Kiko Costa Rica rippers? The most uh, guy I want to show respect to is Osvaldo Trejos, because he was amazing. And there was another group, but you have to understand, like there was a lot of, uh, it was a mixing culture. San Pedro where I grew up was around the University of Costa Rica, and at that time, and it still is one of the best universities in Latin America. So a lot of like Southern American people like from Peru, Chile, and Venezuela came to study. And some of them remained friends, and, and, but they were part of the culture. 
uh, John Larson, El Oso Perez, Oscar Oso, uh, and so many that escapes me now, but uh, they, they, they had their own culture and they brought like Peruvians, they had a huge, they're like, they, they might not have a lot of guys in the world tour like the Brazilians do now, but, but the tradition is there. So w that was always guys like uh, El Gordo Barreda, would show up in Doñana and you hear wow. stories about that, wow. you know. Did uh, Felipe Pomar come here? Not really. I met Felipe later on, just like previous the Greg Knoll event. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, in that era, Peruvians in Latin America were way ahead of the curve. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, that Waterman sheep and now uh, that guy Villaran is an incredible surfer that I respect. Who was the first two or three guys from the Caribe locals that were ripping and, and really conquering those waves. There was a guy named Hugo who was black, just solid. He was yogi, he, he practiced yoga, and he was backside in Playa Bonita. He was amazing because he was just, let me say, just big and beautiful, and he would take off late, and it was so impressive of this guy's uh, comfort in the most critical. Playa Bonita is like, uh, beefed up a la Moana type of left hook. If you look at Chopu and you split it in three uh, sections, cornered, that's Playa Bonita. It was like a slabby left that hit the reef and, and didn't let go, you know. So he was really scared, but this guy charged, but he was local, Hugo Colette yeah. or Cholet. Uh, and then there was. Uh, and other guys that came later, Los Tigres, Fallas, they take people to the island now. Uh, his younger brother, but Tigre, uh, Javier, he was just an amazing backside uh, guy. In, in Puerto Viejo, uh, there was Chiny and, and Delbert, they charged. Yeah. Uh, Chiny was um, uh, Switch Dan, he'd ride the coffin, salsa, they did amazing things, but they were, uh, they were brought in by Alberto Jimenez, who is a craftsman, has built my, my blanks for a long time, mm -hmm. and, and then he passed boards to these guys. Right. And they settled in the early 70s, him and Chris Goberly. Uh, and around what time did Kurt Van Dyke show up? Maybe early 80s, early, super early 80s. Because I, I went there and uh, uh, I was already kind of like visiting Puerto, Puerto, uh, Puerto Viejo, and one day I remember Kurt sitting with Jose, another friend of mine who served with Hugo and Playa Bonita. He, he gravitated towards um, Puerto Viejo, escaping Bonita because it's too close to Limon, and they were always looking for quiet places to do their yoga and, and do whatever. Uh, and then he was driving Kurt around, showing him around, and he was kind of like Kurt's uh, introduction, and then Kurt bought the hotel, and he became a mentor to me and the, and the Santa Cruz culture, which you are from. Correct. Yeah. It's amazing how Santa Cruz has had such a influence in so many remote areas because of, of people like Kurt. A cutback town, isn't that what they call Santa Cruz? Well, definitely my side of town, for sure. Cutback okay, cool. city. I never heard that, but. I saw it in a magazine. That's Point, that's I've never traveled much when I was younger, but I read the magazines. Like, you had to go and get a magazine to find out what happened in Hawaii. Three months later, yeah. there was a shop in, in the middle of uh, San Jose, Central Avenue. You go there, and uh, unless somebody came. At the time, uh, I opened up a, a sort of like a window for me because I spoke English and uh, I was able to speak to foreigners. There was no surfing tourism. There was just like traveling surfers. Right. And then that kind of like gave me the chance to know about their culture, especially if they repair boards or they shape boards or they knew about it. So I was like in that downtime, uh, we gravitated. Hey, knock on the. Hey, what's up, guys? What do you, what do, you do? And oh, my friend is my my brother is a as a is a shaper, for example, that crystal. Uh, carry my crystal. Anyway, there's so many of them. Escapes me, but um, and I wanted to, but not until I got my hands to start to understand what it was. Absolutely, and then on that same t point in time, we're talking like 72, 73, 74. There were the first local guys on the Pacific side starting to rip. Who was that? Local guys, there was like um, Condino, Secondino Arias, who I have uh, hold it very dear to my heart, heart because uh, he represented um, 
a local guy that was born there, he still hasn't traveled anywhere. He's still there, you know. Uh, he doesn't surf much because he watches cars, and that's how he makes his living. But he's like a, it's like a home to us, you know. We come, we park, and he'll he'll cut up uh, coconut, and after we surf boca, and then he'll make an empanada, and then we go back back surfing. And I and and if that's the case, I leave my boards there, uh, and he'll take care of them. You know, so Boca Barranca will always be home. But when I was like uh, getting better at surfing, there was this couple, uh, Kevin and Meredith. They would spend time surfing, which is rock or Avellanas. And he was, they were both amazing surfers. And, and they said to me confidentially, Marco, you need to surf somewhere else. And, and I tried to, I got it. I said, if you want to get better, you, you're already good here. But there's other waves, and now I learned that. Oh, but then I learned. Oh, there's other areas in Costa Rica that are more exposed to swells. And uh, okay, so let's do. And then the, that first place was Plarmosa and Guanacaste here too. But Plarmosa was the place that if you wanted to get your stripes, you go on and 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 he carry stories. He carry stories. Who won the first contest there? You know now. There's a contest every weekend in front of the backyard for the mats or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, these places, you know, but this one thing that escapes the radar is, is before they build a harbor in, in uh, Caldera, uh, the sand would like drift naturally. And then that place next to Boca Barranca was called Doñana. And then that's where most people surf. And if it wasn't good, then they surf Barranca. But that was the, when I was like before even surfing, Guys would come, all sunburned, to the city and say, oh man, Doñana was tubing. I said, what do you mean tubing? What do you mean tubing? And then I learned, you know. I, I, I went one day, I was surfing Doñana, and then this, I stood backside, and uh, the guy said, no, no, you got it wrong. It's like with your right foot forward. I should have been a regular foot, and probably I live in Salsa if I was like a regular foot, but not the case. Now that kind of brings us up to the 80s. Mm -hmm. And Guanacaste, at that point in time, was still unknown to the outside world. One of the guys in my generation was Mario Sotella. His father owned two uh, TV stations, Channel 2 and Channel 6. And you cannot tell the story without including the Wilson brothers, Luis and Randy. And they protected the spot, and rightfully so, because their background was protect your spot. Which spot? Tamarindo was a secret spot at one time. Okay. But they happened to gravitate towards Hotel Diria, which was like a very small and only place to stay. So yeah. Mario was learning how to surf, had an arrangement with Hotel Diria, and in exchange for advertising in his channel, he would stay here for months, and he knew the William, uh, Wilson brothers, and... Um, naturally, um, he had a surf team because he owned two TV stations. At the time, these TV stations show more surfing per week, per hour, than any station in the world, I guarantee you. Or maybe not, but it's, it's debatable. Mario brought uh, guys like Tom Dugan into his trip, and he welcomed uh, those guys from Quiet Flight, the Twin Fin era, Mario was the Twin Fin exponent, and that was debated to some other crew that didn't have access to Twin Fins. They believed more in single fin and thrusters, and Mario was good at, at doing tricks in contests, and there was always that power versus trickery. Uh, so um, anyway, I was like not in the team, but uh, we were at the river mouth here, and it was offshore. It was four feet faces, and I had a yellow single fin, and I knew Mario was watching, and I grab a right, and I'm backside, and I went one, two, pow, hit the lip, one second, one, come off the bottom, two, hit the lip, hit the lip three times in three seconds. At the time, I was also a, a, a martial arts coach, so they took me because maybe, um, well, no, I, I, I sort of like I was like nice until I start getting too many waves, and then you don't welcome Gordy, that's my nickname, because if we bring him, he's gonna catch so many waves, but because Mario 
thought above that a little bit, it was okay. So he brought me to the contest. And then later on, Freddie appeared and uh, winters were like hard to get to. So if you made it, you were safe. He would find mule to go to Santa Cruz and bring rice and beans, but you'd be okay. Yeah. And that was great romantic because every place needs a place like that. You know, off the grid, where guys gravitated, if they have trouble at home, they come and, and they save in us and trade their Walkman to Freddy for more rice and beans. The rest, you know, like Freddy's, is, he, he, um, he did a lot for the, for the region and now Avellanas is still like a destination because I don't find uh, sort of the local uh, protectionism that I find in other beaches. Playa Avellanas has that welcome everybody and it's beautiful, and there is like uh, very, very much op options. Yes, um, it's a very welcoming vibe there. Yeah, it's incredible. It always has been. It is my one of my favorite places. Uh, in, in, and the Tamarindo room out here, the longboarding, it's it's um, underestimated. But what has happened is has always served as a, as headquarters to go, and then you gravitate back. It, from the beginning, it had that quality. Correct. One time. One time, my mom uh, managed a, a furniture shop in San Jose, and at the time, I was becoming a surf guide. And then these two guys pulled up from Miami. They were, and they're still my friends. One of them, rest in peace. Uh, but the other guy was Kevin Gatto. They had boards on the roof, and they parking for a month because they were lost. They couldn't get out of the city. They wanted to go to Limon. It was November, and my mom walks out because she's used to seeing me hanging out with surfers. So. At the time, I was a full-on, like, ding repair guy. So she thought, I'm bringing this guy. She comes to greet me and says, oh, so she doesn't see me and tells this guy, you know, my, my son is a surf guy. These guys are like, whoa, they got creepy, they got everything, but they don't have a surf guy, and I'm, I'm it. So she calls me, I come, I hook up with them, we come and stay in Tamarindo, and the next morning I take him to Avellanas. But it was November, it's the end of winter, and they have a white car, four by four, Land Cruiser, just, tight and from my dad's background days I love to beat up mud and it took us three hours where now it takes 30 minutes or less but there was no mud was gonna get in my way to get into Avellanas with this guy that's that's something I still when I go to Miami uh, uh, for a lot of I'll stay with Kevin and we're great friends I needed to get somewhere and these guys had wheels but I, my looking back on my grandmother when somebody came she would grab him and sit down and have tea in the afternoon and ask them their names. And she was married to an Englishman, but, but, and she didn't speak proper English, but she just enjoyed sitting there and talking to people from wherever they came from. California, Florida, most of them. Uh, so I don't have a problem talking to people that don't serve this day. I just kind of flip the tortilla a little bit. It doesn't matter uh, if it's surfing or not. I'm interested uh, where they're from. And it, you know what? Tony, it's always a privilege. I feel honored when people choose to come to Costa Rica because we're still uh, a good uh, option to go. You know, what What has done for me is that the people who want to cast it, they rub off their tranquility and their pura vida. You know, because, you know, this, like the word stress, uh, it's kind of like, what does, that, what does that mean? Why are you stressed? It's just like, it's not compatible with this lifestyle. Correct. You know? Explain to us how it all came about that when it came time to film Endless Summer, Bruce Brown called you. I was lucky enough to read English, speak English, and I guess I dreamed in English because, uh, but um, it came that Greg Knoll was scouting a place to, to go and do a reunion with his buddies. So I knew that, and I happened to be in Hako at the time at the hotel, because it's such a small, tight circle, you know, the, the, you know, there was no wireless phones, nothing, but you could hear that, oh, Greg Noll is there. So I went there, I kind of walked in front of him, and I came back, and I kind of like, oh, but checking him. He must have been used to people checking him out. Of course. And we made a connection, and the guy that was with him told him I was the guy. I was a surf guide. And um, there was other guys. Uh, but, when you, you share like 50% or 33% of the, the surf guide business, it's easy to be notorious. Plus I was six to 200 and something pounds, which is the same size as, as the bull. 
So um, we connected. He told me his friends were coming here. He goes, um, I don't need big waves, just 10 perfect surf. We just want to enjoy it. I understand that perfectly. So the day came when um, I was working on my shop, doing repairing on Thursday night. Next morning, boom, I'm off to hack on my bus. And I walk into a Hako Beach Hotel, and uh, it was just like a dream, man. I get emotional, but every name of the sixes was there, you know, like from I, I, guys like Mickey Munoz, Greg Knoll, Mike Stan, his sidekick, Bruce Brown. Randy Rarick was the guy that was like uh, coordinating everything, making sure everything. So here was a guy that I knew from just drifting into Tamarindo. He was staying next to me at Cabinas, what is Walter now, it was called Sulimar back then. And I knocked on the door, hey, where are you from? And I knew Randy, so uh, it was easy to, to, to mingle with all these people. They had a surf contest. You're gonna love this because you're a photographer. Leroy Granis took a picture of me. I got fifth place on longboard. I wasn't a longboarder, but I can brag about, oh yeah, one of those person that Leroy Granis took a picture of, you know. Um, and etc. And then on Saturday night, um, in the main ceremony, uh, Randy Rarick introduced me as the guy that knew the spots. So I'm there in front of these people. I'm like, a, I consider myself a crook in front of them because at the time I'm just a ding repair with no experience outside Costa Rica. Uh, and so my first thought was, uh, and let this be a lesson in life, you know, just say thank you. Thank you for coming to Costa Rica. It means a lot to us. And make it brief because you got a line of people like maybe me, nobody knows where Mickey Dora is, but but he could be. So you don't you just gotta make room. After that ceremony, Bruce Brown was at the bar, and I sat next to him and I said that the first time I ever saw surfing was when I was a kid. I was like five or six, and my dad dragged me from the streets to see this movie. I wanted to play soccer probably and wanted to see this movie. He insisted. So that was the end of the summer. He gave me a copy and, and we discussed the possibility of being part of, of the movie. Uh, and I thought, sure, as a guide, because I'm not an actor, <coughs> an actor, uh, and I'm not. <laughs> but. I was in my shop many months later, and then a uh, phone rings, it's Randy Rarick from Hawaii, and he says, Marco, uh, would you be interested in being part of this movie? I said, sure, because Bruce wants you in it. Hello, are you there? Marco, <laughs> I am, man, thank you. That night at the bar, I was like, I was, we went to this bar called El Cuartel de la Boca del Monte in San Jose. And I swear, man, I was grabbing two beers, please, and I was drinking them like full on, like a V8. Because I was going to be, I know we represented, you know, Bruce Brown, Endless Summer. My first memories of surfing are the sun setting up behind on the horizon, and there's like a red fin, and it's translucent. I mean it, baby. And, but like, then uh, it was a job. Course. That was like the tip of the iceberg. I was used to taking people surfing, uh, so it was natural to me. For some reason, it's 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 it's, uh, it's it becomes very personal. Like this is the chance to explain who you are without explaining. How are you going to portray yourself? Uh, Greg Knoll sent some some the bull shorts and t-shirts, but I wanted to wear a red hat that is the red, uh, red uh, forever green. It was a fertilizer, but somebody had given me this hat and I thought I looked good in it. And then that's when we first get here and we're, we say hello to Diff. Explain to me what it is, is exactly that happens in the movie with the seaplane. Oh, is this all about the character that was behind the wheel, so to speak? Because that really happened, right? Yeah, that really happened. They hired a plane to pretend we were going to go surf in it, on it, and it was like an aqua plane. He had made a pass, we were, we were right there at the river mouth, and he had made a pass with this, it was early in the morning, and he came low. He had a reputation for being crazy. Apparently he lost his uh, license uh, flying commercial with people, 
eye level to ground level to the uh, Colorado Canyon. That's why he lost his license, and then he moved down here to keep flying. Who knows? And um, so, in the second, in this, he made a he made that first pass. He went out to the ocean, and then they asked him to touch and 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 take off again in front of the behind the lineup of the wave there in Tamarindo. And then he went behind to make another pass. He just came a little too low. He cut a wing, and then that threw the plane off. Pop, 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 pop. Luckily, uh, it didn't hit anybody. But there was some like German tourists. They were really concerned all of a sudden. They, one moment they're getting a tan, and the other one, a plane is coming, propels on the sand, just going, boop, 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 boop. and they're like, boop, 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 boop. oh my God. And we're all like, did that just happen? So here's number, number one concern. We need to get the tape out of Costa Rica because the Federales are going to confiscate it. The airline Federales. So very. Uh, smartly they snuck it out and and it remained probably the most unwanted wanted piece of film related to a surf story here's another one when they get off the plane the pilot shakes hands with Pat O'Connell that's Bruce Brown doing a Hitchcock thing uh. that's Bruce Brown there for you he's in the movie uh. but all you see is the hand all right, good man. Oh. And well, we were in. Uh, I have to say proudly that when we were in um, Ollie's or Potrero Grande, he went out surfing. I surfed with him. That was an honor. Yeah. We almost surfed the labyrinth. Randy and and Don Miracle wanted to surf it, and of course Pat O'Connell would have. I would have surfed it because I was salsa train. It wasn't nothing. You know, but they said, no, no, just settle. And it was like, we got there like two hours before uh, sunset. Um, and, you know, that night it was hot and wind, but I went to the top of the boat. You know, I get to wait for, for all these like hysterical madness about how to do things. I, I, I'm no part of that. I just want to surf, right? So uh, I just stood there and I thought about salsa. Because salsa is a right, and, and all this is a right, but it's for older people. It's nice. It never puts you in trouble, but salsa will hold you down for two waves. So if I go, if I think salsa, this is going to be like a cakewalk tomorrow. So I come back, and either in the next 20, 12 hours, I, I'm sitting down with Pat O'Connell. He goes, Marco, everybody wants to ride the perfect wave. Me, I just want to surf. And I just quoted him, as I'm telling you this, two seconds ago. But that's the most insane thing. It's true. Yeah. You know, I just want to surf. He doesn't want to be famous. You know, I just want to surf. And the next day, you know, I, I got a wave. And it wasn't like my best wave. It was a wave that I was coming. And I went like, wow. And Pat told me, oh, man, I almost think you was kind of like an air, but it wasn't. But I hit it so hard. I was, I just, but it was like maybe too angry for the movie. You know, but Pat was like, man, I thought you weren't going to pull that off. Thanks, bro. Thanks for what. I'm writing a Cord guy in, in the movie, which is Santa Cruz guy. Yeah. And Cord shaved for Kurt. Correct. And Still all his does. boards wear Cord guy glass on fins. And that's kind of like an influence to this day because sure. I haven't put anything but glass on fins on my board. I know Cord and like many other shapers have gone to uh, plugs and fin systems, but yeah. I'm kind of like a throwback in that respect. No, that's true, and I think it really segues nicely into our next topic, which is board design. Mm -hmm. um, you've been building boards, designing boards for how long now? Well, it started when uh, I took my board to repair, like three blocks from my house, one time, and I was friends with Cangrejo, was one of the guys that, a characters, that uh, super crafty guy, super crafty guy. He repaired boards, and I learned from him, and I didn't have money to... Uh, to repair. So I started repairing my own boards and uh, there was no place to go get fins so I l had to learn how to make fins. So that was early 80s and it's like, um, you know, I'm, it's almost 40 years that I've been surfing a little more and just a little under repairing boards and then uh, towards right after the, 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 the visit of Greg Knoll, I was really anxious to get into surf 
uh, surfboard building. So the guy that was coordinating everything wasn't like a surfer. So I fitted so well with these guys and in the shame of things, like taking people surfing, I was good already with people and pleasing them with their needs and showing around that I felt I needed to be compensated, not monetarily, I wanted a blank. So, but I, w I was asking the wrong guy. And he w I was asking a businessman who said, I don't need you, I already have Costa Rica and I know we know how to do this. So they kind of sidelined me for the second part of the Greg Knoll thing. And later on I met the first, in, in 93, at the end of 92, I met, that year we filmed on the summer in 92, I met the, the, the mother of my first child and took me to Switzerland. So uh, it didn't work out great because I was, living, I was landlocked. I was snowboarding, getting to know Metallica, Rage Against the Machine. I love that, but I miss Costa Rica so much. My calling, my family, um, and, and as a couple, we just drifted apart. Mm -hmm. with, I thought that we were not looking at the same goal right. in life. I mean, if, if I just keep here, I will remain here in Switzerland working in factories. And there was nothing wrong with that, but I really wanted to build surfboards. So I came back in 97. I got a job at uh, the Del Rey and, uh, as a bartender because I used to repair boards for one of the owners. Uh, he, both the owners were uh, water people, boats, but Greg was a surfer. And so that enabled me to buy my tools, build my first shaping room, was good enough bartender to be rehirable after I come here and repair boards for you want to serve. I go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and eventually by the year 2000, I knew that I wanted to make this my home. This almost 20 years ago. Eventually uh, met uh, who is now my wife, uh, mother of my second child. Uh, she's from Italy um, and uh, she, she wasn't going to go anywhere. She was going to stay here because her mom would stay here. Uh, and now my daughter, she has seen, she has grown here. And I feel like my life is complete in the sense that I've passed on. Maybe it wasn't like dynamiting uh, Pargos out of Witch's Rock, but, well, man, let's go get sushi tonight in Tamarindo downtown because it's, it's going to be rocking. Yeah, this place has really evolved, and you've evolved right along with it, and, and your board... Are, did I drift? Always been, did I drift from the question? No, you drifted in a perfect in a perfect way because that's all a huge huge part of the story. It, basically, the essence of of who you are and what you do it goes into every board you make, mm -hmm. and your time snowboarding, all, all that. It's it's super relevant. The time, you know, the times have changed. The boards change. They evolve, and I've always been a big fan of your shaping because in my opinion you're always one step ahead of what everyone else is doing and including right now in 2019 first of all it really impresses me that every time I go to the beach at like six in the morning you're there you're either in the water you're surfing you live it there's a lot of people out there that talk surf that are astute observers but very few of them like you and I surf every single day that has guided our life decisions, our priorities, and the work that we do actually is 100% connected to our free time, which is passionately diving into the sport, art, and essence of what is surfing. What I love about your board design, you tend to have a lot of width in the back part of your board, and you don't really abide by the blunt nose concept and the combination of those two things makes a board that that you can rip on yet still gets easy speed and when the waves aren't as good and then when the waves are good it gives you extra squirt for kind of next level carving so i really really respect that kind of a plan shape and it and it amazes me that i don't see more like performance-based surfers ride that kind of board. What I see mostly is kind of a normal short board with a real narrow nose and a thin, narrow tail that the board has to rely on the wave for speed. And so my question for you is this. 
What is it that you visualize in making a plan shape so that the board itself gathers speed? Every board builder dash businessman needs to answer. Do I want to do this to grow economically or do I want to grow this? Do I want to do this to find meaning in my life? And what's that meaning in your life? Who you are, where you're from, are you doing it? And a lot of us, the billboards, will copy something because it's hot, because it represents something that is easy to sell. We all do this, but at one point, you can't do this for forever. When I had my place here on the beach, I could have turned that into a surf school dash rental, but there was nothing for me to learn because that's what people were doing to make money. I maybe have sh should have done it, but instead I used all my time to uh, build my boards and create the sort of depth. I build my templates from boards that I love, but now, for example, the board that we just built, for you, we use four templates, but we created something, that feedback that you gave me and I give back, respecting certain parameters because every, what is important is to keep the melody. That means we can't get so far ahead to where it's no longer a surfboard. I have built a board this year that is almost perfect and I know th that I can rest in a way because it represents, I'm living my youth, my 80s when I was in Barranca, and I was kind of like the guy in the water, because at one point you want to be the dominant guy. I used to read in magazine, oh, when, when Johnny Boy paddles out, everybody feels it. He dictates, when he's riding, all the mice come and eat and grab, and they go, you sort of want to be that guy and not be that guy, because now that I'm older, I'm loving sharing, and seeing how people stoke, that's an unselfish act. That makes you grow, that gives meaning to your life. So if you can put uh, a board uh, that is not uh, parallel to the growth equation, meaning hours work versus dollars, but it's an honest, transparent, so, but it's not that hard. All you have to do is keep the melody. And we spent time the other day um, in the shaping room. I told you how I stem off my center and that board will be smart regardless of who goes towards the nose or towards the tail. If it's compatible in the middle where you feed your, and then it passes water, it's just the most simple. It doesn't get, you can't get more simple than that. So I found a way to uh, make it simple and that works because water loves simple. It's not that smart. It doesn't care if, if you have a, a brand name or a no name. It just loves that if, if it's simple. And that's the basic concept of my, 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 my shaping philosophy. I, I love to spend time in my board. Sometimes I'll be surfing and I'm thinking, God, I wish I was in my shaping room. It would be more fun. It's quiet. Uh, I could be creating a surfboard for somebody, but... Uh, and it, it happens often, you know, and, and the thing about getting up in the morning is just about getting early to bed. You know that the best people you're going to meet in this life are going to be in the water or on the way there because they're up with the sun. Uh, it's a good habit. Yes. Don't, you know, like the nice girls, they all go home after 9 o'clock at the bars. You're not going to meet anybody good after 9 or 10, you know, so it's simple. So true. What are you excited about for 2020? The people. The people, because my body is not young anymore. And while I'm good at my craft and my boards, only it's these people that I'm going to meet the billboards for, that they're going to allow me to build boards that I wouldn't be allowed for myself. They're going to be better boards for younger people with hungry hearts. Yep. That's it, they got a hungry heart. Me, I obtained my tiger on waves of consequences. It happened a few years ago at a, a secret location here in Avignanas. I was doing an event for somebody, but it was kind of like a quiet event. People could donate to, to a friend of mine 
who had suffered a, a motorcycle accident. And then I was surfing this outer reef and this wave came and I took off and it was so critical and, and, and I made it. And, but it was so close to not making it. And then luckily Javier Quiroz was on the shoulder. I didn't know he was in the water, but we were both stand up out. I said, oh my God, you see that? But, but more than that, the wave, uh, it was like it took the weight off my shoulders. I said, I got into a critical situation. I survived through my skills and desire. I don't feel like I have to prove to anybody anymore if I like the dangerous, consequential waves. I know this, but it, now I'm enjoying myself so much more in the water because I don't have to prove it. It's great. I mean, it should happen to everybody. Absolutely. I, I hope at one point in their career, they can find this, uh, this, and they enjoy more. Now I'm enjoying every day also because of life. It's a gift and, and it's not guaranteed. There's no guarantees, Tony. That's for sure. So we're here, we enjoy it, and, and, and then um, tomorrow we don't know. Yeah, correct. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Definitely going to have to get together for part two because this just oh. opened up a whole new <laughs> room in my yeah. mind. No, to absolutely. I appreciate uh, this setup here. It's, it's incredible. I feel special. <laughs> well, you are I special. feel like grabbing two kombuchas and drinking them at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, solid. All right, Pura Vida. Thank you, man. I appreciate Twanis. all the nice things you said about me. Thank you very much. I mean, that touches deep. Nice. Right on. Wow!